for the 2011 FormFast Visionary Showcase and User Group Meeting. I'm Aaron Vaught, the host for this year's event. There have been a lot of exciting developments in FormFast in the past year, and we're pleased to share them with you. I'm also excited to have some of our customers share their FormFast success stories and outline the benefits they've received from our solutions. We started, there's just a few housekeeping items to go over. We want to get your feedback throughout the event. Please send questions either in the Q&A or the panel on the right side of your screen at any time during the presentations. We'll save them and present them to the speaker at the end of each section. And please note the audio for the will be broadcast through your computer speakers. If you experience audio difficulties, please send a chat message to the host so we can approve you to, to join the teleconference. Once connected to the teleconference, make your computer speakers are muted, otherwise you might experience an echo. Third, as you might have seen in our advertisements, I tend to be eligible to win an iPad 2 for each of the user group meeting. If you attend both days, you do your chances of winning, so we encourage you to come back again for tomorrow's session. We'll also be giving away an Amazon Kindle at each of our regional breakout sessions this afternoon. Winners for both prizes will be notified after the conclusion of the user group meeting. Finally, as mentioned, our event will span two days, today and tomorrow. Today's session will include presentations from hospital leaders discussing the value of workflow automation and its importance in any process improvement program. There will also be a technical update discussing new features in our product line and information on ways we can connect with FormFast. Today, the user group meeting will conclude breakout sessions where you'll be able to interact with other FormFast users in your region. Tomorrow's session will highlight some of our products, including Form Designer, which allows you to create or convert a form into a fillable electronic document with advanced features like customizable drawing lists and calculations. We'll discuss FAST Flow, an enterprise workflow automation system, which is designed to streamline communication and maximize collaboration across every area of your hospital. We'll have to learn about a few of the exciting applications we've developed for FastFlow that address some of the most critical needs in a healthcare organization. Today we extend our user group meeting to include non-informed Fast customers as well. We this was a great forum to showcase all the ways we're, we're improving business, the, the business of healthcare. Excuse me. So welcome to any attendees who may be joining us for the very first time. To give us an introduction on who FormFast is and what it's about is our founder and CEO, Rob Harding. Rob? Karen, uh, good morning. Welcome to you all. Uh, first, uh, we want to thank you all for attending our fifth international user group conference today. We had a huge turnout and looking forward to up to date on our new solutions, services updates, and uh, a new products that we're releasing this year. Uh, Format at verified by Hims Analytics continues for its fifth year. This is a document workflow company in healthcare with the largest number of clients in its competitive categories. We're very really proud of that. The advantages it provides to our clients in terms of the revenue which is available for market and product development on your behalf. So it's really a good thing to uh, to be with a strong player in the software world. Uh, also, uh, We have uh, 185 Meditech Magic clients uh, as part of our base. Uh, we welcome our 400 Meditech client server customers, our 150 McKesson clients, our numerous Siemens, QuadMed, King, and particularly uh, uh, we're welcoming a, a lot of new Epic and Cerner clients this year. Um, so from smaller hospitals, from our six-bit hospital and station Texas, as, uh, as well as to our many new large IDN customers, uh, such as HCA, CHW, University of Maryland, Howard University, uh, we welcome you all. Geographically, we've now spread to the United Arab em Emirates, and uh, our folks will attest that it is indeed a long ride to the United Arab Emirates. Emirates. In the past year, demand for our products has been um, it's been enormous. Um, 
more so than ever in the past. Uh, we've been communicating through webinars, through massive advertising. Uh, we've utilized a lot of industry speakers and experts. Um, uh, put a variety of messages out there and, and being heard more than ever. Uh, and much of our focus has been around use of our solutions to achieve lean operations and ease a plethora of pains and departments which are impacted, impacted by ARA and uh, related legislation. Uh, but those are departments which are not funded or well funded to implement automated solutions. So those departments uh, include case management, risk management, uh, the ability to do physician freeze. RAD and related audits, uh, and particularly various uh, holes in the major HIS platforms, uh, where we need to assist you in capturing field data to make the EMR complete. So we wrap ourselves around uh, the major packages, what you have, and we make it complete. While well, that has always been very strong in the small and medium sized systems, it is a, somewhat of a change in 2000. 2010 11, whereas we have a large IDNs uh, contracting with us, we've traditionally uh, uh, stuck with preprinted forms, and so they're uh, increasingly moved to new technologies. Now, as most of you know, we have print management products such as Fast Print, the print products on demand with related electronic signature solutions. Uh, the motivators to buy these products are a limited of the cost and obsolescence of preprinted forms, uh, along with the automated capture of these documents to an archive using barcodes or cold feed. A really expected modest growth of the print management products is uh, um, data is captured online, but that's not the case. Uh, many hospitals who perhaps not been in the vanguard of clinical automation gear up for the EMR documents is an obvious first step to a long-term objective. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of pressure on budgets. So that's a, a major driver of um, a team of the time and effort to eliminate preprinted forms across all departments, uh, whether those are clinical, administrative, or whatever they are. Um, we find uh, that our customers are very responsive to integrated solutions whether that be Edison, McKesson, Siemens, Epic, Loss, and others, uh, it's really advantageous to have as few interfaces and sign-ins as possible. So we find that our customers want two to five key vendors, not 10 to 20. And that's one of the reasons FormFast integrated tool set, which covers enterprise workflow, has been in high demand. They, most departments, have no sophisticated automation outside of uh, the clinical and revenue management areas, which are funded, and our base are indicating a desire for a single vendor solution to handle all those points of pain. Uh, either that or the ILOs will start you see, when you're buying products that just do risk management, just do HR, do case management, uh, or various other siloed functions. Changes we've seen are our customers' attitudes and approach. Uh, there's a much more positive attitude to change, greatly improved project management uh, available uh, from you all, and at a time when we might expect you to be more difficult to work with due to all the, the pressures on you, uh, to the contrary, your professionalism has been outstanding, and, and we thank you so much on behalf of all of our staff for being so great to work with. Our key goal for the future will be to increase the level of communication with you. We need to know what business models work for you, what applications are, are important to you, and, and how to put it together to make it easy for you. Uh, we found, for example, that interest of subscription software, both on-site or hostess, has been very high, such that SAS now accounts for over half of our new contracts. It's where they that upper management of IDN to reverse the SAS as a model, which is not true five years ago. They clean out compare SAS to capital purchase, and they 
the model that needs to be to, to a purchase hand. So um, change is upon us. Uh, this year, before our presentation from our other folks of what's new or different or uh, important, um, we want to take a, a brief opportunity to set the stage for you in terms of who we are. We realize that many of you were not involved in the decision to buy our software. Uh, you may not be familiar with our company or uh, all of the elements of the product you work with or other products that the company has. So, uh, uh, you, in fact, were, you volunteered or you were volunteered to support our software. So I'll ask those of you who know us well to spare a few minutes while we define who and what that is. So the um, first slide shows you a beer delivery document. Um, and we show it you know, for a reason. It's, uh, uh, something that was used two or three thousand years ago, and uh, it's really form and it has data on it, and it continues to work similarly today. The data is only usable to a few people who can see it, and the form is useless and, in fact, rather heavy in that case. The, the reason we put it there uh, is because really, conceptually, nothing has changed other than the media, which is now paper. So we've been doing things the same way for a long time, and you know it, it can be uh, quite changed when we move from uh, uh, paper forms to electronic forms. Now that uh, we really communicate with each other um, across departments, so we want to get the uh, connecting with each other. And then. For many, ask why so much paper? So these are some of the reasons that uh, people have a too big a project. Um, you know, we can't get IT to support it. And these reasons come up at uh, 1,500 or more hospitals that uh, are using our software that have made that transition. And that's, that's a big percentage of U.S. hospitals. But what you're looking at here is um, the process for um, most of your paperwork uh, still in 2011. A lot of clinical things are automated. Uh, you follow the inner office mail cart around, and um, uh, most, of, most of your administrative functions, HR functions, a lot of your uh, order clinical functions are still uh, on that card or being moved around on paper charts. What we're going to do is move you up a pyramid from a uh, printed form to the form is printed on demand. Uh, we don't have inventory and then move you to a complete business process improvement scenario. So we're working with the management part. Um, and I think most of our uh, use will see uh, if they're in the clinical areas or thing where they select forms or, or a bunch of forms from one side of a screen, select it from another part of the screen, and hit print, and all start forms, or these could be HR forms for onboarding, uh, um, forms are created on demand. Uh, so our of course, advantages to this and that we uh, are interface or we're collecting you know, barcode for account number and medical record number. It's just a, a baseline kind of product that allows you to take advantage of your investment in EMR technology. The advantages of the management piece that many of you have is you know, patient safety, uh, ECO consultation identification, uh, and of course, it's obvious, but very important thing, eliminating preprinted forms, labels, obsolete forms, annual indexing, uh, and distribution costs. The other product to the uh, print management product is the uh, Linux signature product, uh, through we capture 
signature signatures on consent forms. So we, we've come uh, uh, over the years, you know, the expert company uh, doing this at, at to all the devices that people want to use and having interfaces to all the different software uh, across the country that people may want to interact with to create uh, those signed documents uh, when signed and we get them stored and archived in EMR. The uh, called product, we do very well. Moving into the top of the pyramid, uh, the part which is serviced by our fast flow or workflow product, flow document workflow. So we're looking at a diagram of a rack audit process, which is uh, um, which is that we use in our rack audit a piece of software. Yeah. So uh, a lot of our customers are, are, are kind of clear uh, why workflows being as important as they are to uh, functioning, why are they not addressed in health care? Why nobody offered a solution? Why is, why is the form seemingly the only uh, company offering this? And um, really there, there are a number of of things, uh, but the primary ones are that uh, workflows are embedded in other uh, expensive systems, and there aren't companies selling workflow software. Uh, really, you know, enterprise solution uh, just kind of comes with the things. It's hard coded into other things. So, uh, with the result that for a lot of simple transactions um, that you might want to engage on your own. Uh, there are, simply isn't any way to do it. But, uh, you, know, big, you know, bigger dollars are focused on our solutions rather than um, um, focusing on enterprise problems. So, so we're all clear on what is a workflow. It's a very much uh, uh, overused word. Uh, let's take an example of what we mean. Let's say purchase requisition. For the user to request, you know, we go to the electronic mailbox, we uh, pull up a form, we fill it out, and we send it to our supervisor, and the supervisor you know, will uh, review it and approve it and send it to this uh, approver person in the process. Uh, and in this case, the, uh, the business rule, which says if the uh, amount is over $10,000, it must go to a VP for approval, and if it's under 10,000, the supervisor can approve it, and it goes to the thing. So um, these are some things, but um, most of you have purchase requisitions on that mail cart. So what are the kinds of things that you do with workflow software? So, uh, applications are endless, but we, we show in several categories some of the ones that um, uh, you may already be doing or may be interested in, such as the uh, back audits, the charge master updates, um, key management, uh, we have a management solution, risk management solution. Um, the most popular one really is our uh, uh, is uh, uh, use of a workflow to approve forms, which is uh, kind of funny. Um, so um, in the clinical experience um, you know, area, of course, pre-admissions are important. Uh, uh, we do a lot of work with downtime, you know, in the clinical areas because there's a lot of things being automated, uh, but JCO uh, requires you know, a strong downtime solution, and um, our, our product is perfect for that. And to education reconciliation services. Uh, Compliance area, policy and procedure management was, was really one of our early products. We started with six or seven years ago. Incident reporting, credentialing. Um, I is, um, you can see that capital expense request is always a uh, uh, difficult process. And of course, in the HR areas, things like uh, evaluations, which are annual evaluations. 
which be done according to his absence and just little administrative things like IT work orders, um, office move, uh, approvals or uh, automating you know, payment approvals. So these are all things that you, you can find a product which uh, uh, addresses almost any of these one things which is an independent piece of software by someone with huge expertise in that particular area. Customers are telling us they can't afford to do it that way. So uh, we're working diligently to flesh out each one of these workflows and to give, give you a best practice example of each, plus the ability to make your own satisfaction. This is a uh, key. Um, so, a system that uh, goes across all those departments, um, initially to um, create a form on the platform, like piece paper rather than the printed form, and it's a step that we took like the completely paperless system. So, uh, uh, thank you all uh, for bearing with me so that I can set the stage so you'll understand um, what we're talking about and some of the Features follow. So thank you. And uh, now I'll turn it back to uh, Aaron for the next part of the program. Thanks, Rob. Next, I'd like to introduce the first of our keynote speakers, Kim Butsey. Kim is the Senior Director of Revenue Cycle Health Information Services at Howard University Hospital in Washington, D.C. She's joining us to speak about the benefits of workflow automation in the healthcare organization. Welcome, Kim. It's all yours, Kim. Okay. Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon what time zone you're in. Um, it's my pleasure to um, present this presentation um, today. The the control to drive the the uh, presentation now. There's been some minor technical difficulties. I'll be right there. Have any issues with your telephone or with the uh, presentation itself? With the presentation itself, not able to scroll forward. You should have uh, control of that. Let's try one more time. But I can uh, scroll through the slides for you if, if you'd like to. Uh, just indicate when you'd like the, the slide to be changed. Thank you now. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, our objective today, I'm going to show how automating workflow can help other hospitals, how it can significantly reduce administrative and paper-related costs, how it can increase patient safety and policy compliance, can increase standardization of documentation and quality reporting. Also, um, very important to us here at Howard is to drastically shrink our carbon footprint. Takeaways for today, key takeaways will be discussing why it's important for hospitals to work towards sustainability, how transitioning to a paperless environment can help um, your organization, how to evaluate the workflow automation tools that would work best for them, 
what pitfalls to be aware of in planning, implementation, and rollout of automated workflow technologies. And in particular, how Howard University Hospital is working towards a sustainable, paperless environment. A little bit about Howard University Hospital. We're located in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. We're a private, non-profit teaching facility. We're also a level one trauma center. We have 482 licensed beds. Um, recent statistics show that for our inpatient discharges, they were over 13,000. For our clinic visits, over 83,000. For our emergency department visits, over 45,000. For our outpatient surgeries, over 7,000. So we are a medium-sized hospital, but we have a substantial amount of, of patient um, activity on all levels. We do have plans to drastically de decrease our carbon footprint. And a key component of this plan is to become a paperless hospital. We have several projects in place to help us become a paperless hospital. And one of them is to use the form, use the different form applications to get us to that point. Took a look at how many pages do we actually generate per year? For our inpatient discharges, those represent almost three million pages per year that we generate. For our outpatient clinic visits we generate almost 500,000 pages per year. For emergency department visits, we, we generate nearly 1 million pages per year. And for outpatient surgeries, we generate nearly 250,000 pages per year. Total pages for a year for all of these services are over $4 million. And this is um, probably an underestimate for us, um, pretty conservative, but we think we're way over for 4 million pages generated per year. That we're using to help us in addition to our FormFast partnership to get us to a um, paperless environment, we, we are on our road to implementing a electronic health record. And with that, we have the Syrian EHR suite and a variety of system integration. Uh, we're on track to meet meaningful use through our enterprise document management solution using um, clinical, electronic clinical documentation systems, medication administra electronic medication administration, computerized physician order entry, e-prescribing, and then a plethora, literally, of um, system integrations from legacy systems that we currently have. Our discovery process for our road to our electronic health record, we cataloged over, not, over 700 forms. Um, we still have new forms every day, almost, that are being asked for. We have forms that are being requested to be revised. Um, we have forms that we're deleting, and we've established several um, form templates um, so that we can start our standardization um, of forms. The standardization of forms is very important in order to get a handle on what kind of documentation you have so that um, you can be better. What prompted our transition to being paperless? Well, one, um, one was our environmental stewardship. We wanted to make sure that we were becoming eco-friendly. Um, we have lots and lots of shred bins located throughout the organization, um, so we, we're making sure that we're um, pro um, promoting um, an eco-friendly um, environment. We also want to improve our policy compliance. Uh, also, we want to mitigate patient safety issues so that if we have electronic information av available, we're creating a better environment for patient safety whereby information is more readily available. Oh, improving the bottom line. We have a lot of um, measurable objectives that we want to attain by becoming paperless. For example, 
people retain the wait time in our ambulatory care settings, be it the outpatient clinic environment or the um, emergency department environment. Um, we want to also increase efficiency and productivity. Make sure that we have 100% of patient information available to our nurses, our physicians, our coders, our billers, and anyone that needs that information um, to render care or perform business processes for the organization. We want that information to be available 100% of the time and also simultaneously. We have a plan, and it's a master plan. We had an idea, and the first steps of us going paperless was de actually determining the feasibility of a paperless initiative. Then we had to earn buy-in from hospital stakeholders and also then gain approval from hospital leadership. Uh, we were lucky in this instance here at Howard University Hospital with new leadership, they brought in that idea of being paperless and going green. You will find not too often meetings conducted here at this facility that there's actually paper um, laid out on the conference table. Everything is done electronically. Um, documents are sent via email. Um, there may be, a sign, at the most, a sign, paper sign-in sheet. We use PowerPoint presentations. Um, they're projected on overhead, and that's the way meetings are conducted here. The per issue, and it's a big issue. Over 700 forms um, worth of issue. Um, we have again we have hundreds of different forms used. So our, our standard forms, some are um, ad hoc forms, some, some, and a lot are rogue forms, forms that are created by individuals um, on the spot or at home and brought into the environment here. Um, what we found is that pre-printed forms quickly become obsolete. Um, redundant, there's redundant information captured by paper forms, and it's difficult to control standards without an electronic workflow. Uh, our pre-printed forms, actually we've been able to uh, make a lot of revisions and get rid of a lot of pre-printed forms, especially the ones we, we pay outside vendors for. So that's been a significant uh, cost savings for us here. Our idea actually became a reality. Um, we started evaluating um, available solutions. And we concluded that workflow automation is a huge part of the equation. You can still have forms, but how do you move the forms through the process? How do you move the information through the process? So automating the workflow was a, a huge part of the equation. My department, we started leading the charge on how to become paperless. We started sending out um, information on, on why it's good to become paperless, becoming eco-friendly, reminders about going green, as we call it here, and remember the environment before you print. And so we started to develop a step-by-step -step strategy, actual work plan on becoming paperless. And this work plan incorporated um, um, the form mass, um applications as a part of the as a part of the strategy along with our overall EHR implementation. We have a timeline. Back in December 2009, there was a decision to go paperless. That's when I came into, around the time I came into the organization, and that was one of my top um, objectives, to get this organization paperless. And to, to, by December 2011, we have reformatted and or automated about 90% of all of our clinical forms, either through upgrading um, different systems, um, form standardization re or, or um, revision or deletion. By January 2013, our entire organization will be approximately 90% paperless. And we have about 95% of the workflow throughout all departments will be automated. Things we're going to automate are our charge capture process, our release of information um, authorization process, our request for information process, 
process, and the list goes on and on. You have a manual process um, for MAS is able to um, roll out a automated workflow associated with the information and our forms. So again, our four-year process, and it's going to be a four-year process for us, began back in 2009. We expect to have a savings reaching at least $1.5 million in the first year of our paperless operation. So that's a, an ex extraordinary cost savings for the organization, but we know um, that it is attainable, and we're making measures along the way. Implementation is, is a detailed test-oriented, and it's step-by-step. Um, we expect to have a full integration of workflow automations with an electronic health record by 2015. So we have several many projects along the way that are a part of the overall implementation to becoming paperless. What did, we, what did we need to do to solve the problem? We needed to control inconsistent form creation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of rogue forms, forms that have not gone through any process other than the person who wants to utilize the form has um, created a form. We have a lot of um, personalized physician orders. We have a lot of personalized physician progress notes. And these these are definitely rogue forms that have not gone through um, any process, but a, a, approval process. But once they are written on with clinical information, we have to accept them into the medical record, whether they're rogue rogue or not. Um, we need to also design forms through an approval based workflow process. We do have a, a forms committee comprised of. Um, um, representatives of the medical staff, nursing, risk management, and compliance, um, a typical form, forms committee um, composite we have. And that committee, um, because of the volume of forms that needed to be reviewed for our EHR implementation, um, we decided to um, do things a little bit differently and get an electronic catalog of all of our forms. So as we uh, review, create, in revised forms, all of our forms are sent electronically um, to FORMFAST, what makes it very nice for the modifications to be made. So managing our documents electronically, we struggled a little bit in the beginning to see how how effect how best effectively we could actually manage these 700 plus forms. All needed to be reviewed, cataloged, um, assessed for um, redesign, um, combinations, or um, elimination. Um, also, we needed to automate workflow across all hospital departments. Um, this process of automating workflow has been socialized throughout the organization, and people are now thinking about how can I automate my workflow with the documents that I'm handling now. So we've gone out and, and, and um, with our charge capture team, so that all of our charge capture forms will soon be electronic fillable documents that can route through workflow route through workflow so that forms are not bu um, gathered, bundled, and, and manually transported throughout the organization to be processed, um, that, that, will, that will save a drastic amount of, time, of staff time and will be more um, efficient and no more lost documents. Also, we're looking at um, another workflow into the release of information process. Um, we're also, and in, in part of this automation with fillable documents is to have documents that are legible. So many of our patients that come are, are frail to, too frail to write or may not be comfortable filling out forms because they don't understand the information on the forms. So our vision is to be able to pull this release of information authorization form up on a computer tem, tem, um, terminal or hand it to a patient on a template have have it pre-filled with some with patient information, have the patient fill in um, some basic information, sign 
on the form electronically, and it will upload into our release of information system, which will kick off the um, request for, for that information. So we're looking forward to that. Also, we have a large research um, base here at Howard University Hospital also, um, which, is a, which um, gives a big influx of record requests. So our record request process is a manual process now, but our vision going forward is to be able to have an automated workflow where users request information um, online via an approval process um, captured through a document that's fillable online. So we can track and correspond back to the requester as to the status of their um, document request. All with our research arm, we will be helping them uh, automate their workflow through their institutional review board or their IRB approval process. So we're going to be able to promote this automated workflow, workflow through the forms through the forms management tools through our entire enterprise. So we didn't start off thinking that this would be a solution just for managing medical records, but anywhere there's forms and information that this solution will will fit. Improving compliance and patient safety, um, there's stop gaps in, to build electronic forms. We want to prevent submission of incomplete forms, whereby certain, certain data fields on forms are mandatory. You can't get past them or you can't submit the forms unless all of the selected information is completed. And so we want to ensure patient safety as individuals' care pathway unfolds. So we vision using these electronic forms and forms place built through the form fast applications, um, built in measures so that um, certain information must be filled in um, to ensure and improve compliance and also patient safety. What are some of the benefits of a paperless environment? This is just some. The, there's many more um, benefits of a patient of a of a paperless environment. Um, all patient information would be available electronically. Um, information can be imported and autofilled. It saves saves it's a time saver, and the information is legible. Uh, errors such as mislabeled patient information is kept to a minimum. Significant amount of paper saved through sustainability program. So. Paper, you know, we are planning on uh, minimizing um, print print capability, and actually, the numbers number of printers that we have um, in the organization, and doing more of a central centralized approach, so we can control um, printing in the organization. So and overall, uh, cost savings for the hospital, savings on paper toner. Um, our printer supplies, the maintenance of our um, print, print and copy machines. So we're driving more people to the to desktop or to their portable device to look at information. And looking ahead, we do expect an immediate return on investment for for automation solutions implemented. We're already realizing um, returns on our investment. We have, as information is becoming um, available electronically or uh, workflow is being automated, uh, we are turning off printing um, in key areas. Things that are electronic, we will not print. Uh, that does create a hybrid environment for us um, temporarily until we are fully um, electronic or automated. But we're working through that, and we're surviving. Um, the staff has been the entire staff in the organization has been met with, so they have the buy-in as to why we are going paperless and the benefits to going paperless. Feedback um, that we've gotten is that, oh, I don't have to get up and go to the copy machine anymore to print out these forms. I have space at my I'll have space at my workstation now. Um, preparing to go paperless, we took a tour. The, of the especially the nursing units, and you could see file cabinet after file cabinet after file cabinet, just filled with reams and reams 
reams of forms. Uh, in addition, our copy center has reams and reams of forms also. And going forward, I'm sorry, but, but during this process now, when a form is revised, we have to go and make these rounds that make sure these um, obsolete forms are taken out of production. Um, so in order to, to benefit from this electronic forms environment, um, we are doing away with the standardized forms inventory on the unit and going to a, a print-on-demand so that no one will be able to stockpile forms. The copy center will no longer have to stockpile forms and you know, make copies and deliver, et cetera. So we're getting to be in a much better place than we were previously. Um, we are expecting millions to be saved uh, by going paperless with, with these from FAST solutions and our overall EHR implementation. And, of course, the long-term benefits is always directed towards patient safety, which results in so many different um, business objectives and benefits, and also the compliance piece of it. So that, that's the um, end of my presentation. And I just want to conclude by saying that this has been a, a wonderful journey to see the, the results of our um, of our efforts to become paperless. We're we're on board with going green. Um, we advertise that we're we're eco friendly, and we definitely are are saving paper, um, saving the environment, um, increasing our um, efficiency, re reducing costs, and we're realizing the benefits of of going green and saving paper. Thank you. We appreciate your insights. I do have a couple questions here for you. Uh, the first one was to describe your process for defining a workflow. Uh, for example, what staff members are involved? What was your uh, what process to get that going? Sure. Well, we looked at key stakeholders first. Well, define what, what the process is. And actually, flow chart what the what the, we would chart what the current process is involving the the key stakeholders, the people that are involved in the current process, and then designing the process around a, a paperless um, workflow. What would it look like if we weren't handling paper um, in the process? So it's a matter of design. So, you know, many design sessions, um, critiquing, um, but definitely the key stakeholders were involved from the very beginning, um, describing the concept, knowing what the tools are that we were going to use to actually design the electronic um, workflow. And, and it's been well receptive. I have uh, many, many requests to um, design additional workflows. Great. And we also uh, encourage all the attendees to uh, send their questions to the uh, Q&A section of the interface on the right side of the screen or the, the chat window as well. We had a question. Um, you mentioned compliance. How has FormFast contributed to, uh, to greater compliance? Just from the, the redesigning of forms and making certain fields mandatory has helped with, with compliance. Um, our, our forms that we're migrating to uh, these different form fast solutions and, and templated versions, so they're fillable forms, we're able to um, mandate or put a hard stop at where information must be, be contained. So if we know that information is required for um, for a Joint Commission standard or Department of Health standard, a CMS guideline, um, a best practice, et cetera, we're able to hard stop that within the fillable fill document. Where prior to that, uh, these forms are just hand, hand filled in, and we had to then go back and review them for compliance. So the compliance is almost guaranteed um, at the onset if the um, hard stops are put in place up front. We we have another question coming in, but I think uh, it, it's more suited to our product management director, Sean Curtis, who, who is sitting uh, with me. Now, the question is: Can you utilize fillable fill forms without using uh, form flow, the form flow, flow product? And they they mean the the fast flow product with that, Sean. Right. So uh, uh, to answer Helen's question, um, 
FastFlow product to give you a user interface into the form, so you can fill those out and put the required fields onto those and things like that. Other than that, in the design of the form, um, you know, you can just make it more specified what's required. So if you're using our fast print or our form imprint product, print forms on demand based on uh, patient registration or other logic, the design of that form might display with, uh, you know, more bold or, uh, you know, uh, more obvious what fields are required uh, to be filled out. Uh, also, those tools that I mentioned, Form Imprint and uh, Fast Print, have the ability to put information that you've already collected through other systems onto the form through mapping in the business logic. So being able to pre-populate a large percentage of the data on the forms, aside from just from the patient demographics, which is typical, um, putting in other information that's required on the form that you've already collected uh, is another way to uh, utilize those tools. But as far as having a user interface to type into fillable fields, that's a fast flow function. And FastFlow also uh, accommodates the data integration as well. Perfect. So that's it for the questions for Kim. Kim, we think oh, we've got a couple more coming uh, in here. Well, we just got one more question that just came in. Uh, so I asked, Kim, are you using FastFlow for purchase requisitions? I think that was something you may have mentioned or, or mentioned that you're moving towards. But we're not at this point, but that is part of our vision to um, use it for purchase requisitions. That we want to use it. We want to use the FormFast products on an enterprise-wide level, so not just for clinical information. Thanks. And uh, you also mentioned when you were talking about form redesign, um, the obsolescence. And so uh, we have someone who's asked a question about how do you accomplish finding and and the direction of outdated forms uh, that are maybe stashed away uh, or, you know, in storage or wherever. Well, it's it's almost uh, like a manhunt to, to find these forms because as soon as you think you've recouped, we have to go physically to the units and make rounds. We send out alerts, like most wanted form, do not use. Um, so we're, we're in constant communication with the clinical areas the, including the unit secretaries, the nurse managers, nursing, our coffee center, you know, we just uh, to everyone in the organization. But we do physically make rounds and re discard and remove forms. One more question on that. Um, so the genesis of those forms is, in some cases, the fact that maybe they've run out of a park supply or maybe they're preparing for downtime. Do you use, uh, so, so the use of, of form fast, how to eliminate those needs of, of maybe keeping a supply of paper forms and preparing downtime? Do you use the, the form imprint for a downtime solution? Yes, yes, we, we do. We do. Um, the, we have special, you know, not many people, we have the frequently used forms, um, a very minimal inventory to be dispersed during any downtime, but we don't expect to be, you know, down that long. So we do have a minimum supply of frequently used forms that we can break out in the case of, of downtime. But Copy Center has been instructed not to fulfill any request for um, medical record forms without, author you know, without appropriate authorization able to get back to the source fairly quickly to find out why they are um, asking for medical record form copies. Perfect. And a question from Peggy. Uh, she'd like to know, how do you get your physicians to buy into standardized forms and not their specific forms? Well, we show them we have a clinical documentation improvement program here, and we're able to demonstrate how standardization um, helps with um, reporting on quality measures, outcomes, uh, better communication amongst caregivers. We we have the ears, luckily, of all the department chairs who are very um, involved in, qual in quality and, you know, um, good patient outcomes, et cetera, and have bought into the fact that good documentation and standardization correlates to good 
to patient safety and good patient outcomes. So the physician buy-in, um, you have to achieve that. Great. I think that's all the questions we, we have at this time. Kim, once again, thanks for taking the time to share with us. We appreciate your insights and, and, your, and your great presentation. My pleasure. We're joined by Brad King, who is a senior systems consultant here at FormFast, to give us a technical update on our product, products. Brad? Hey, Brad's coming on the line right now. Okay, thanks. I was muted. Um, what I'm going to do today is go over some of the new features that we've released in the last year in pretty much all of the FormFast products. So I'm going to share my computer and actually going to show you the product. So if everyone can bear with me, you know, it, it's a sort of live demo. So if there are issues, we'll work through them, but hopefully there won't be. What we're looking at now are the slides that I'm actually going to go through because there are, are several things that I'm going to go through that there really aren't. Visually, you really can't see them. They're just um, enhancements that have been done. So I'm not going to be able to show them, of course, but we'll talk about them a little bit. First thing we're going to look at is Forms Designer. Forms Designer has, has undergone some vast transition, and mainly because of Windows 7. So the initial plan for this was to upgrade this so that it would be Windows 7 compatible and work perfectly perfectly with Windows 7, but in addition, our programmers have done quite a few changes to it and made some really, really nice enhancements to it. We're going to look at those now. Um, the install, you will note now that it actually creates the printers for you that allow you to print to Forms Designer and also allow Forms Designer to um, create the PL files that are needed for the other FormFast products as well as the, P, uh, the PFs that are needed within the FastFlow product. So look at all that. So the printers, looking at the printers, the printers it creates, um, if you look here, we see that it creates a printer called Print to Forms Designer and it allows you to take forms from Word from your other programs and actually bring those into Forms Designer. And then it creates a, another printer, print to fast print, that actually is the print that's used in the background to actually create the PCL files that we're going to use within the fast print product and within the form and print product and within web form and print. So that's the two printers that are created during the install, and it's nice that it does them for you. Before we had cheat sheets where you had to go do that manually, and all that it does that all for you. The other functions that we've added are two other functions are the save to PDF and save to PRN. In the past, for the PDF, you had to do some steps to make that possible. And for the PRN, you had to do a whole bunch of steps to make that possible. Now we're going to flip back to that one more time, and this time we're actually going to go to the Forms Designer product. And so this should look really familiar because the appearance has not changed that much. So for the people out there that have the Forms Designer product, they should be familiar with the screen we're looking at now. And what we're going to look at is a couple of the new functions. So look under File. You can see now we have Save as a PD, uh, Fast Flow PDF, Save as a Fast Print PRN. Are a lot more or a lot easier to use than the prior method for doing either of these. So now we have that function where you can just simply do Save As. And for the people that have had to do it, though, they appreciate the benefit of that. Check the slides. And the other function is it's probably more exciting for the people that actually have to design forms, our forms designers, as well as all the customers out there that design their own forms. And it is the spread horizontally and spread vertically. 
that was something that was sorely missing um, and is in here now and is really pretty easy to use. And I'm going to give you just a quick demonstration of how that can be done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some check boxes down. A fairly typical thing you might do. And I'm going to put some fields down as well to go with those. And I need to get the quantity right. That's important. So we got one, two. And I'm going to line up the bottom and the top because it uses the bottom and the top and then spaces uh, down from there. So then I'm going to get lined up. I'm going to first hide all my boxes. And before I do that, I'm going to take my lock off and switch selector. I'm going to chop my boxes and the very first thing I'm going to do is to align them. So I'm just going to align them and I'm also going to align my labels. And I'm going to move my labels over closer to the boxes. And now for the exciting part. What I'm going to do is I'm going to line this one up um, so that it's actually lined up perfectly with the box. And I'm going to line this one up the same with the box on the bottom. I'm going to select all the boxes. And I'm going to choose Spin Vertically. And I'm going to select all the labels. And I choose Space Vertically for that. So you can see now, in the past that would have been a quite laborious job, and now done, snap. So ILLI really is going to be nice for the people that have to do forms design. It's something, once again, that we really, really needed, and, it's, and it works well. Just remember when using it that it is based um, on the top and bottom. So it bases down from the top to the bottom. But the first one right and the last one right, then it will correct all the ones in between. So that's a pretty exciting little thing. I know it's, it seems good to the people that don't do it, but for the people that do, there are massive applause. Um, there are two things we really aren't going to show, but we'll talk about, and that's the ability to use a command line to convert OFMs to fast flow forms, as well as we've got another one to convert OFM forms to PRN forms. So that if you've got to do a mass conversion and we have people that bring up hundreds of forms, it gives you the ability to do those hundred forms very, very quickly. So you can create bat files that will go and grab a batch of forms and convert them from OFMs to PCLs or from OFMs to PDFs. Next we're going to look at form, web form imprint. A lot of people still using thick client form imprint. There's nothing wrong with thick client form imprint. But we're concentrating now in doing enhancements in web form imprint. So we're going to talk about web form imprint, and I'm going to show it to the people that haven't seen it that have the thick client, as well as going to show the, some new features with it that are really, really neat for the people that have it out there. So I'm going to switch to that now. And I apologize for the jumping around, but I, I could have done screenshots, but I think that it shows better to um, actually show the product instead of showing screenshots. So what we're looking at now is the web form and print log. And one of the things on my list of things to show you, um, before we get to the workstation level printers, it was the top thing on the list. The second thing was case sensitive passwords. In the past, passwords and usernames weren't case sensitive. Um, now the passwords are case sensitive, and the way you can tell that is in the past it used to be admin admin. Now admin admin um, won't work, but the admin is actually uppercase admin. So I'm holding the shift key and typing admin, and now it's going to let me in. So it is case sensitive. Now, the way you can know you've got the new version and that it is sensitive is that you won't be able to get in 
without using the uppercase or the case that you type the password in, whatever it might be. So it's a good thing, it is a feature, but you may have issue with people that don't remember the case that they used when they typed it. So it's good. It's a good thing that it's done. It's a shame it wasn't there initially, but it wasn't and it is now. Um, we're going to look at the sunning piece of this. And we've actually now incorporated for the first time the eSig product, the ability to sign on the form with the web based version. And it's done with a really neat tool. Um, one thing I will make note of here, it does require that you have .NET 4.0 on the workstations that are going to actually be doing signing. So it, it does. that's the requirement. It's free from Microsoft. It's easy to install. It, it does take a little bit of time to install, but it's not difficult. Um, that we've also given you the ability to choose a form, actually choose a patient, and have that that form jade an image by simply printing that form. So I'm going to click print and actually print that form and you can hear my printer in the background. I apologize for that. And you can go in and sign that form. I'm going to choose I don't remember which person I chose, but we're going to see if that's them. We'll know quickly. Now I'm going to click the sign document button, the button that we have here. can see it launching the eSig piece. I picked the wrong patient because there's no images for that patient. So I'll choose one that I know I've created the image for and I'm actually going to uh, and I could have grabbed the paper I printed. That would have been smart. But. And I'm the technical person, not the salesperson. Um, so what we're looking at now is the form that I printed. And you can see based on the yellow dot here, and that's an indicator that they've added, that this particular form has not been signed. In addition to adding this ability to sign, I'm going to get into this and explain this, and this can get a little confusing since I'm not going to be able to show this firsthand. In other words, I'm not going to be able to show you firsthand. I'm going to try to explain the best I can what these different functions do and how they work. So we have always had the ability with the other eSig piece with the ZIG client to do tablets. That's what we're looking at here. And that we where the form was displayed on the tablet. And they said we had the ability to sign that form and then archive that form. Additionally, what we've added are the things here to support the right screen. And what the right screen is, and let's see if I can do that. Um, this is the right screen. What the right screen is, in cases it would end up being a second monitor. Is that what we allow? We allow you to um, use the second window for annotations. And what that does is allows us to put this form on the right screen for the patient to sign. In other words, the right screen would be facing the patient. The patient would be able to write on that screen as if it was a tablet PC. So, on this, and we typically choose the orientation so that it's just like a paper. So the ability to then write on the form just like they would on a tablet PC, but the per the admission person would still have a normal PC and a normal monitor for themselves. If that makes sense. So it would be. Using a tablet, we would only have the one screen. Using a right screen, we would simply click this button that would allow for a second screen for signing. Some other options um, are secondary writable screen, the Clip Gem, Siglite, Siglite LCD with a one, one and a half inch display or one by five display or the clip gem color and it's got a five by seven display. And looking at the um way these work and we can do that. Um typically 
for the smaller signature pads, we've got a new function where we would highlight the annotations. I didn't set this one up for that, but I'm going to go ahead and check it. And you can see that my signature field is up here at the top. But what we would do, it would give you the ability to display that. What people do with that is use a smaller clip, clip gym and not the FED or color, but one that looked like. And we pull it up. One that like this. Um, what we, we can do, where what people have done is turn the monitor so that it's facing the patient. So they still have a second monitor, but that second monitor is just a normal inexpensive monitor. And with the highlight annotations, it displays where the patient is going to sign. And then as they write on the smaller pad, it actually shows on the screen the patient signing for. So it allows to not use paper. And they would simply click OK to go from field to field to field. And the person doing it would actually be able to watch as they did as well on their monitor. So both people would be able to see it on their monitors. The patients, though, would only see the form. They wouldn't see the buttons. They wouldn't have access to the buttons. So the, the admission clerk would still navigate for them. I hope that made sense. So that would be using the, the small pad. And the third way, the, uh, actually, we've got two more ways, and I'll go through them relatively quick, but I've got plenty of time today. would be the sig color or the clip gem. And everybody, or everybody has at least been exposed to the clip gem fields, whether they chose to use it or not. And the clip gem simply looks like a clipboard. The way the clip gem works, we put the paper on it. You actually write on the paper, and we capture it as they write on the paper and then the patient would simply take the paper with them. The other option that we didn't have until recently is the Clip Gym Color. And what Clip Gym Color allows us to do is actually present a portion of the form on the pad where they can actually see it on the pad and then write on the pad to sign it. So we can break the consent up. And if they have multiple signatures, we can break it up in pieces so they can actually see each piece as they go through it and actually sign the form here. And it, it will generally require some redesign of the form to make it fit on this so that it's legible. So once again, several, several different ways to do signing here using the, the display on the little pad, using a secondary right screen use a tablet PC, using a secondary screen with a SIG light, which is a little tiny little pad, or using the clip gym where you actually put the paper down on it. I hope that sense to everybody. It's fun a monologue to tell whether you're doing a good job of explaining it or not. Um, as the form signed, and I'm going to go ahead, and first I'm going to check and see how I left that. Um, better. I'll go ahead and click Sign, and as I sign this, um, we'll see that light turn green. And once again, I told you I'm doing this live, and I'm doing this actually on a, a virtual machine, one, one gigabyte of RAM. So bear with me one second. That reason for the warning. All right, so sign this, and I'm going to hit finish. And what we're going to see here is that our dot also turned green. And I'm a glutton for punishment, actually, not doing screenshots and actually showing it. But, but that's where we are. So you can see that now it'll indicate when they're ter when they're signed. So if you had multiple pages, because it's very seldom you'll only have a consent form. You have Right to know, Medicare, Medicaid letters, Champus letters, uh, HIPAA, all those different forms they have to sign. So typically you would have more than one thumbnail here and you would actually go through them. Once signed, you would hit Archive All and they would actually go to your imaging system, whatever that may be. That covers the signing piece. Uh, the other thing on our list 
and we'll flip back to it and see. Actually, I was supposed to be showing you the printer piece of this, and we're going to look just a little bit at the admin piece. The biggest difference, I think, between the thick client and the thin client for the people that are still on the thick client is the thick client actually is managed on the PC level. In other words, it prints to your local printer, and it's managed on that local machine. Here, we can what machine you're on, but it'll still all be managed on the server. So what we're going to look at first are the workstations. Now we have the ability to choose an alias category for workstation. And I know that doesn't mean anything to anybody but me, but what an alias category is is a group of printers. So we can create a group of printers for a group of terminals, if that makes sense to anyone. Example, and I'll give you a reasonable example of that, would be let's say you have a third floor you add all the third floor workstations, and for each of the third floor workstations, they add the printer alias for the third floor. That would give them in their list of printers that they had a choice of choosing all the printers on the third floor. That way, when a printer did jam, and all printers are going to jam, it will have the ability to choose another printer, and they won't have to call for support in the middle of the night because their printer's jammed with paper. They can simply just reroute it and use a different printer until somebody's able to fix that printer. But it's neat all the different ways that we do all the things we do in here. So we'll look at those because that's actually on the list as well. Um, we can create locations and we can filter the patients forms based on the location, and we can assign people to locations, or we can allow people to choose their locations. Ace categories are our way of grouping printers, and you create one giant alias category and put all your printers in it, or you can create subcategories for each of or for groups of printers as the example that I described. We filter patients on the workstation level as well, as well as um, the printers that they see based on the workstation. We can create groups of users and can put filters on the users. So there's lots of different ways to filter this. So you can do it in groups, in workstations, or by location or a combination thereof. And by, combine, uh, by combination, it doesn't actually combine them, but uses the first one that has a filter, if that makes sense. And that's actually defined by site options, and we'll move to there. So you, can, you have a filter priority. So what this means is it will look in the group for a filter. If it's one, it will use that. If it doesn't find one there, it'll look in the user, and if it doesn't, it'll look in the workstation. And you can rearrange these. So you can prioritize them any way you want to prioritize them. So all the different things, but once they're all managed on the server, where in the past they were managed on the workstation. Another caveat to this for the people that don't have the web version is that the Sir actually does all the printing. So all the printing is actually done from the server. Web interface is, for practical purposes, a window to the server. So we need to add all the printers that are necessary to the server and work with you if you decide to do that. But basically, all the administration is moved from the remote machines to the server. One of the neat new things that we've added, and we've added it to a couple of our products, to FastFlow and to this, is, and it, it's not a lot to look at. It looks very, very simple. Basically, what we would do here is put the LDAP domain. What this is going to do is authenticate the user against the domain. And so, what it does for you is it gets rid of the user password. For example, in FormFast, my username is B King. What they would do, I 
I would still have a user informed fast called B King rather than keeping my password within FormFast, when I log in and when I type my password to log in, it's going to take that username and password and authenticate it against the LDAP domain. And if I pass and have access, then it will log me into FormFast. If I don't have access to the domain, it won't log me into FormFast. The advantage of that is you don't have to maintain another password. And to utilize the password and nail that. So, really, what it's doing is getting rid of the the password that's kept within FormFast. I'm going to back to the slides and make sure I didn't miss anything, and I don't believe I have. So I covered the, the workstation level printers, the case sensitive password, e signing, the circles showing signed and unsigned, um, access to the URL. Um, I'll show you that in just one second. Let's verify I've gotten everything else and I'll cover anything I missed when we go back to it. For, for many different SIG devices, that was all that big dissertation I gave you and hopefully didn't confuse everyone on the call. Uh, LDAP, we authenticate through LDAP, which is really cool. Uh, we've got all the different filters in there, and we should talk about that a little bit. And the last but not least, but we support all different operating systems, including obviously XP because I'm running on XP. So the server systems that we would, that we support now are 2003 and 08, 32 and 64-bit. So I'm going to flip back one last time to what form in print. And we're going to look at the one last thing I didn't do. And what I'm going to do, I think I've got a favorite save for it. Hey, Brad, just real quick, I had a question about um, what LDAP is. Can you give a brief uh, explanation of LDAP? Um, LDAP is basically, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but I could look it up. But what is this authentication through the, your network domain. So when you log into Windows and you type your username and password, and down at the bottom you'll have hospital.com hospital. It authenticates you to actually have access to your network. So if that's taken away from you for whatever reason, then in this case you wouldn't have access to FormFast. So it, it also gives them that control that you have to be a, an Active Directory user or an LDAP user to be able to authenticate to that. Great. Is that Any question on, um, uh, from, from when she'd like to know, will LDAP work for multiple domains? Um, at this point, it will not. So at this point, it's a single domain. So it would require two servers to actually authenticate to two different domains. Thanks, Brad. And we were looking at the command line, and I swear I thought I had saved one. Right, so we can actually get to it here, and I can show you a What's what I'm talking about? So if I go back to that session. Um we can launch this from a command line. We have an account that we've set up that from their HIS system, from their emitting system. Passing a URL, uh, a basic, uh, thing that you see up here, and go grab that and show you. I apologize, I thought I had it saved. I don't know what how that got on. Um, basically, 
URL. Here we go. I do have some in here. So this actually, if you send this command to Internet Explorer, you can then launch the signature app all by itself, if that makes sense. Um, the advantage of that, it um, it's fine too, is that we can actually embed this within the other application so that if they are only doing signing, if we are creating these images from fast print, so when they do an admission, these images get created, they then I key over to FormFast and have FormFast just bring up the signing window. In other words, bypassing uh, the need to go to um, imprint at all. So they go straight to the through the image rather than having to come in here and choose the patient and click the sign button. So it saves them those two clicks. So the URL thing was talking about, and sorry, I did a lousy job on that, but it's okay. We'll move on. Hey, real quick, we have a question while you're in the navigation. Um, someone would like to see the archiving tab administration screen, and uh, just for explanation, that is basically where we define the integration to the archiving system. So if you want to just Show that over that a little bit real quickly. It certainly. So the archiving tab is where it allows us to feed your imaging system. And what this allows us to do is create a, a template for a, an index file as well as in a template for the name of your image file and to export the images and the index files to a specific location. And uh, once again, it, if, you've, if you're, you've done it with the thick client, it's going to give you run the same output. Or if you've got a cold feed from Print Manager, it will be roughly the same. So we're going to give you an, a TIFF file and an index file for imaging or in certain cases just a file with the name identifying what it is. The name could actually include the medical record number and account number and also the form type. Does that make sense? So I'm I'm not at all used to giving monologues, so feedback. So I appreciate the questions. Um and I think I've missed the slide. Okay. So we look at the uh, uh, functions in Job Designer. And there's some pretty cool things to do. We're going to flip over to Job Designer and I'm going to show you these things. I'm going to show you, and I'll go through them first. Um, so I'm going to show you the intelligent mail barcode and something new that the post office has just started. It's a barcode similar to the PostNet barcode, but this one actually contains more information and looks different. So we have the ability to generate that. Um, we've added Gothic font. Basically, Gothic uh, can replace Courier, and it's a monospaced font versus a proportionally spaced font. It, what comes into play is when we're laying down large volumes of numbers, it checks especially. Uh, you'll want the smaller amounts to be over to the left and the larger amounts to be further over to the right because of the way um, proportion based fonts work. This is a fixed pitch font so that the, the character will all be in a place, and I'll actually show you that. A null printer output, which is something we should have had a long time ago, but we've just added, it, and it's a wonderful thing. It allows us to now just simply discard the thing instead of what we had to do in the past, which was write a file and then continuously overwrite it. Uh, the overwriting didn't cause any problems, but this way it's just cleaner. So it didn't, it, it, it's a nice thing, but it didn't something we couldn't do, but now we can do it neater. Um, we fixed 
error, and what we're talking about there is an error where it used to actually close for you, which would be one of the save often examples. So they've worked to that and also created an escape to deselect stuff that you've selected. And we'll do, look at that. Now we have the ability to uh, embed the email messages within the document itself. So we can actually grab a piece of non-printable text and actually put it in the message so that we could send different email messages to different merges, if that makes sense. And we'll look at that as well. So now I'm going to flip over to that and we're going to look at those. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at Job Designer. Um, first, we're going to look at the the code file. And you can see it looks different. Before, the they all used to be the same um, in line on the bottom. So you can see they jump around, and the font is actually called an Intelligent Mail Barcode. And it's 20 characters long, so it's made up of all different values taken from the data, but it actually makes up 20 characters. You can go to the U.S. Postal Service to get information on that, but there are discounts uh, for putting that on your postage, so it may be that that could be the thing that paid for FormFast. In addition, what we're looking at here is the Gothic font. Um, before this was a courier font like the fonts you see up above, and I'm going to change it back to courier. And you can see this is the font that we're uh, we've used in the past. And I'm going to open up actually. Like that. And we'll go back to APK. You can see it in Courier now. What I did was actually just change it to uh, Gothic. And make it 7.6. You can see the difference. And the Gothic does look nice. It looks larger, even though it's really not. So that's the Gothic font. Um, printers now and the printer aliases. Before you had the ability to print the file, you simply choose File Output, and you would actually type the um, what's the name. Let's see if I can show what that looked like in the past. That's what it used to look like, and that's what we did to do a discard, and it would simply overwrite that file over and over again. Now we actually have a null in here, which simply discards the the data altogether. Um, the selecting it and then clicking on form. Now, what we ended up doing was doing something like that, and then you couldn't get rid of it. Now, you got to do is hit the escape key and you select that. So that was the little piece there. In the email function, now we have the ability, and then I can't highlight it, but I can move my mouse around it. Um, we have the ability to pick these things up from the form. So these fields would need to be actually included in the merge, and one of those is email message file name. So we can actually include the file name of a message that we want to go pick up to actually send it along with the form. So we now have the ability to do different email messages with, with different forms. So doing more than just payroll. If you're doing AP or something else, we can actually email those along with that. And covers pretty much the changes to job designer. And these are recent all these are recent changes. So you'd need to get the very latest version to get that. You can look at print manager and it's there's a couple of things that have been added. One we're going to look at, one really there's not a lot to see. It's that it will now create images of the correct size. In the past, if you created an image of a legal form, you would open it and it would end up being an 8.5 by 11 because all the images were 8.5 by 11. 
now actually create the image to match whichever what it is that you've chosen for your form. The one we're going to look at is the top one. In Pre Manager under Settings, we have the ability to bundle the output based on the time interval. So, uh, you could increase or decrease the time interval if you bigger batches. And uh, there's not a lot to see, but that's what it is. Uh, not many changes to Print Manager. H7, there are quite a few changes to it and updates to it. Uh, it including uh, of supporting the A40, 41, 47, and 49 messages. And for all the HL7 geeks out there, that will actually mean something. Um, so that's not something that we're going to look at, but it is uh, important. It will actually now support more messages, and with uh, I think MetaTech 6.0 now actually supports these. So different systems can support them, and it may be something you want to add if you already supported them and just exclude them because we didn't. So 40, 41, 47, and 49. The district date and time is now cleared when we get an admission. So the HL7 should not uh, have a different date and time when admitting somebody, but now it will all update, even if they were if we'd gotten erroneous messages before, it will correct that. The formatting of dates is really nice. Um, the advantage of doing that in our HL7 patient tracker is that now when the staff go and they look at patients, Actually, going to see those in the um, form imprint or web form imprint in the correct date format. So I know we're probably the only country that uses it, but month, month, day, day, year, year with slashes or dashes or whatever you've put in there. So it formats it the way you tell it, and it allows people to use the date format they're familiar with versus the HL7 format, which is year, month, day, hour, minute. So it does look a lot better when you're going through the thing looking at it. Um, multiple trackers on the same server is something people have wanted for a quick while and something that we've actually now made available. So we made available in the past the ability to um, the ability to, to um, Multiple print managers. Now we've made it, made the ability to uh, to run um, HL7, so we're going to look at that. And I haven't jumped around too much. I, would, I just would rather show you the real app than just screenshots. So what we'll do first is launch what I've, for lack of a better term, named the live HL7. And within it, I've got my own configuration, and I can change that configuration to be whatever I want it to be. And um, then I've my test HL7. And once again, I can also change it to be whatever I want it to be. So you have different ports for it versus live, and you can run two on the same server. Um, also, for the people that are running a, a reasonably old version, in addition, back a while back, we had actually given you the ability to connect to a different database within HL7 that is specified. So you could have a live database and a live HL7 patient tracker, and a test database and a test HL7 tracker all running on one machine now. In the past, we used to have to have people create two machines for that. So that should have a live and a test with, uh, once again, running on the same machine. So uh, let me show you the dates. Sorry. So dates within here, um, and I had it running. 
the date within here, and this is important to note. Um, if you're setting up the dates, all you have to do to convert the date of birth from the old format, which was year, 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 month, month, day, day, um, to a date is simply to click here. Important to note that um, when we do that, it puts the date format in a month and year just like you would like it. So a month slash day slash year, but it doesn't zero fill the date. That sounds like a petty thing, but on certain forms we need it in that particular format. So we need it in for example, for January 1st, 1963, we would want 01 slash 01 slash 1963. And if you simply click that, what you'll get is 1 slash 1 slash 1963. So what you're going to need to do is put the optional format and put mm slash dd slash y, 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 y. And you'll actually get the zero. So now you'll get zero one slash zero one slash one nine six three. So that you have to do to do the dates. And the neat thing is, once you've done that, is that when you go into uh, form imprint, and I don't believe I had done that before I launched my sent my messages to form imprint. So we'll look at it, and I'll show you what it used to look like and what it could look like. So, date of birth. So you can see the date of birth, and what it'll do now is be, that would be 03 slash 31 slash 1946. And that's a petty thing, but people always are asking, and it's now you can do it. Um, before you do it, you need to fix the forms because it will change the data going to the forms. So it needs to be coordinated, but it's worthwhile to do. Next, uh, and we're wrapping up here, and I'm probably wrapping up a little bit early. So, if we have, we would, we're going to entertain questions too. And if anybody's got any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer those. Um, the FormFast supported platforms, and we've worked hard on this, and now we support basically all the existing or all the current operating systems. So, all the from XP to Windows 7-64-bit. Gene's actually running Windows 7-64-bit. I'm running the uh, form imprint on a XP machine, actually on that same machine running IAS as well as SQL. So it's doing pretty good to chug along and get all that done with the virtual machine that I was using. So to pull all of these and any of these. And now I'm going to we're going to switch over and we're going to do questions. I'm going to switch back, I guess, to Aaron and get Aaron and Sean to work with me on fielding questions. Thank you. A whole bunch of questions that came in. Um, let's go ahead and start with the, the first one. Um, very simple question. Uh, what does a person do if they'd like to get more design training or any sort of training for that matter? Uh, who can they contact? Um, they would contact Kim Schroeder. She can arrange for that, and we would love to do that. I take it personal that people utilize our software. So to have our software and you aren't utilizing it to its fullest extent, please contact her. The cost of training is is relatively inexpensive. We have different options available. We have on-site training as well as we have training in St. Louis that you could attend. But if you have the software and aren't using it to its fullest, seek out training and, and start using it. You've paid for it, and I hate to see people not capitalize on the investment that they've already made. Absolutely. And I'm putting in the uh, corporate number in the chat right now. So if you want to call that number and ask for Kim Schroeder, she'll be able to help you out um, with with uh, setting up training, either design or technical training. Second question, uh, we have to ask, I have to recreate all my jobs if I want to change to the web version of Form Imprint. You don't, 
um, basically all you'll have to do to switch to the web version. Uh, the the only big step of, of switching to the web version is is the printer end. You will have to add all those printers. You'll have to configure the printers and users on the server. So, uh, but you don't have to create new merges and jobs. You'll see uh, typically people on the thick client, almost all people on the thick client, using local printer for all their merges. So all I have to do as far as the merge change goes is to change the printer, local printer to prompt. And or basically that's the only change that's necessary there, and it's a single change, not a change on each merge. But you would have to add the users and printers. Okay. Another question. Uh, wrote in, we're thinking about using electronic signatures. What device do you see most used in hospitals? Uh, personally, my preference is the clip gym. Um, you have a 90-year-old woman that can write on the clipboard and not think twice about it. And the other alternatives are similar to what everybody's using in the grocery store, so people are becoming more familiar with them. But the signature pads. But my preference, personally, is for the the clip gem, the clipboard. And we've not had anybody or any patients have a problem with the clip gem. Um, the disadvantage is it's still using paper. So if you're really pushing toward the go green, uh, the alternatives, all the different ones, get rid of the paper. The uh, clip gem. Seem to work really well. The little, or not the clip gym, the um, light seems to work really well. But once again, it's tougher, I think, for the old folks than the than the clipboards are. We got another question along the same lines. We have three consents. Can we put all three pieces of paper on the clipboard device? Absolutely. So you can um on the clipboard and I'm gonna switch back for one more time. On the on the clipboard it actually uh electronically senses through the paper so you could absolutely put all three pieces on there. You would want to make sure the one they were writing on was the one you had on your screen as they sign them. But yes, you put them all three. They can buy the first one and then pull it, remove it, fill out the, or flip it up, and then fill out the next one, flip it up, and then fill out the next one. The person will be able to monitor it, so if they did make a mistake, it, you can tell. So it wouldn't be a problem either, but absolutely. Great. Kim wants to know, how do the electronic signature devices communicate with the network via Bluetooth, wireless? Fortunately, none of them are wireless at this point. They all actually are USB. They'll have to plug into the PC where the person is actually doing the signing. Um, I can't believe they haven't introduced Bluetooth, but they have not yet. I can't imagine that it's not in the works, but today they're, they're, they're USB. So all of them are USB. Another question is SIG. Emma wants to know when signing, does FormFast keep track of how many signatures it needs? How does it know when all the signatures are complete for each form? It steps through them one by one. If you're in, in what we're talking about, I, I would assume is the being something like you see on the left here, the SIG gem. So what we're going to have is the form on the left, and you're actually going to watch them as they do it. It's going to step you from one signature to the next signature. It's going to step through them until you're complete. And using that, we would typically use the sign to all button. So it's going to automatically take you to the X form once they find all the positions that they need to sign. Another question about facts. Can effects or effects come into the workflow? Uh, so I had metadata and FormFast create an index file, um, and it goes into the EML without being printed. Is, is that possible? One more time. 
Okay. Can, can the uh, facts or e-facts come into a workflow? I'm going to add metadata and then form has created an index file and then have it fed into an EMR. Uh, I, I believe that's in reference to FastFlow. Okay. Uh, FastFlow can pull the metadata, but as far as taking it in a fax and automatically, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a manual process to do that. But it's, it, it would be something that we would need to look at on a case by case basis. You make a global statement, of yes, and but it's something we would entertain looking at. And uh, from this John talking uh, product management, I've looked at uh, other integrations, and of course we have integrations with partners where we're sending context to our applications, such as Flashflow. Um, so we can. Uh, you know, part of what FastFlow does is it sends the metadata with the content to the archiving system, uh, creates that indexing file with the, the text that it's received. So there are integration points that we can work with on things like that. So just to know a little bit more about the scenario to uh, really address it. In lines, uh, FastFlow, we have a question from Cindy. So I noticed that when she uses the save as FastFlow uh, shortcut, it's a submit button to the bottom of the PDF file. Uh, it's a clickable button, and she doesn't understand the purpose of the button. Can you kind of uh, fill in the answers on the purpose of the submit button on those PDFs? The submit is actually, it, and for lack of a better term, I, it saves the data that's entered into the form and used within FastFlow. So if you're just saving PDFs and not saving them for FastFlow, then you just want to do a file save as and choose the PDF. Um, the, the save as PDF for FastFlow is going to put the submit button. That's what we use within FastFlow to save the data and uh, save the form. So uh, when you create a regular PDF, you can't save it with the data. You can type the data and you can print it, or you can fax it, or you can print and fax it, but you can't see the filled out form. So that's what FastFlow does is allows you to save it. So it almost should say save instead of submit, but in some cases we auto approve, so the submit button actually does submit. So that's what it's for. Great. We're actually having a FastFlow demo tomorrow in tomorrow's session, so we encourage everyone to come back for that. In regards to Meditech, can you can you send forms to Meditech scanning and archiving? Be able to yes, and we can send signed forms as well as we should be able to cold feed forms like your face sheet form. You may have that going into Meditech, but if, for lack of a better word for it, uh, you it looks utilitarian. It's the data, the raw data that they saved in the imaging system. And have the ability to cold feed is like the face sheet, and it'll look like a printed face sheet with lines and titles, and basically a pretty face sheet. Okay, Cindy, your question: In systems that have a clinical, uh, they have a clinic and a hospital, do they really work together on forms, or do they have separate processes? They both. Um, it's silly to exclude a clinic in this. The requirement for web form imprint or thick client form imprint is going to be a PCL laser printer. So they, you, you should give the clinic access to the same forms that you're using in the hospital. Some people do, some people don't. I'd say it's 50-50, but it, it seems crazy to have them using copies of photocopies and photocopies when they could get an original out of the system. Okay, guys, I'm sure they're good uh, reasons. Question Sorry. on uh, WebForm Imprint. Ideally, to convert from a previous version to the latest version of WebForm Imprint. Um, it shouldn't be a big deal at all. But you're probably going to want to work with one of our technicians like myself uh, to that it shouldn't be a big deal. But we would just want to make sure because 
people that aren't using form and print that should be, uh, once in place it's a critical thing. So when we do an upgrade, it affects people. So we want to make sure that you're covered for any issues that might come up, but we don't expect any. Great. So I have a few questions to go through. If you have a question, feel free to send that uh, through the chat window once again or the Q&A section. Next question is, can I send an email which includes several pages, for example, a multiple page purchase order, to and create it one tip for all the forums? And I apologize, but that's one I don't know the answer to. I've always done one page and one uh, email. I know we can send multiple pages to the same email, but it, I don't know about combining the pages in one email. So we'll have to find that out, and we'll have to find out out and get back to you. And there may be somebody on the call that knows other than me, but I don't. I don't personally know that. Brad, Sean here. Yeah, that is a feature of the product that we can send the multi-page uh, tip. So it's just a, set, a few set up fields in the form so that it knows that it's linked to one another, and then it can be generated as a multi-page tip and sent out. Some fast flow, though, right? The, the print product. Okay. All right. All right. Good job. <laughs> The question is, are you still requiring the, a form fetch user to be logged into the server to be running the jobs opposed to running them as a service? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. And I it, I know the time frame for switching to a service, but it, it, it's, not a, it's a common question. So but today, yes, today we still do require it run as a uh, application. A, a question uh, in the chat about joining the teleconference. Um, the audio is being broadcast through your computer speakers, but if there's an issue with that, uh, send a message to the host of the chat that you have, you're having an issue, and we'll approve you for the uh, for the teleconference. Another question. Oh, this one is it's going to be for Sean and since he's online. Currently, uh, this currently presents all forms for patient to sign first then presents forms again for interviewer to sign next. With the interviewer logging into form imprint with unique password, we would like for the interviewer's e-signature auto-place auto on the forms. So, Sean, can you, can, you, can you speak to that? Yeah, we've run into that, and, uh, and we're actually addressing that right now with our next release of the uh, uh, annotation and e-signature client. So uh, we realize just what, what Steve has written here is true, that the Either that's presenting the form for signature or signed into a system so we know who they are. So taking that information and creating a digital signature that's not a handwritten signature uh, is what we've done. Uh, that way when that person presents the form electronically for signature, the patient who's an unknown user will sign with a pen and stylus or uh, you know some type of tablet. And uh, that way while the person who logged into the system can just right click on the field that they need to apply their digital signature to and we'll stamp that digital signature onto it. So that solves us a lot of problems as far as uh, you know passing something back and forth between two people or presenting things uh, in duplicate. So uh, that again is coming to the next version of uh, the annotation client, each signature client. Great. We have another question that just came in from Rick. I'd like to know uh, for payroll can we email the direct deposit notices as an image, a PDF, to the employee? Can you speak to yes. that? Yes. That's the simple answer. Um, we would either we would need something to indicate what their email address was. If you know, in, in, more than likely, we would need the email address added to the data stream. We could grab the whatever naming convention the facility might have, but you know, there's always the exception to that. Uh, not generally being the exception where when you got a really common name they stick a number on the end. So it, we'll need the email address, but absolutely. And I think it's a great application for that. We talk about going paperless, no more direct deposit slips. 
no more printing and disseminating them. Well, that's all we have for, for questions uh, now. Thanks, Brad, for a great presentation. Um, at this point, I'm going to move it over to our next speaker of the day. We're joined by Tony Tola of Fremont Route Health Group in the city of California. Tony is the Director of Project Management, and he'll be sharing his experience with FormFast and many insights into how to make your hospital more automated. Thank you for us, Tony. Thank me. Do you need me to um, pull up my my copy here? Yeah, but with the delay there, it should should see it now. I don't see my presentation up there. Press the tabs on the top. You should see a, a, a tab with your name on it. If you're not seeing that, it might be on the drop down on the far right. Okay. There we go. Hey, good afternoon and uh, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Tony Tolia, and I'm going to share some of my uh, experiences I've had with automation and some of the thoughts that uh, have spun off of. Uh, my experiences. I've give you a little bit of background on me. I, I worked uh, most in a large organization uh, with a lot of great people, and uh, observed um, the move towards automation in the 80s and 90s uh, in physician credentialing, uh, in uh, from the perspective of the IT department, installing pharmacy systems for inpatients and outpatients, and also uh, online electronic formularies. Uh, I moved into uh, the consulting world where I started to get exposure to electronic medical record um, technology. And I went to various hospitals and did uh, EMR discoveries, which uh, if any of you are making these moves uh, as healthcare systems, and I imagine most of you are, um, I would strongly recommend that you do get a uh, third party coming in there to do a full-blown discovery prior to just jumping into the EMR fray. Um, after that, I actually ended up here in California on the West Coast doing um, the project management. I'm running the uh, PMO office here, and we have a very robust um, project portfolio, a lot of automation going on. Uh, we have uh, implemented a patient registration in nursing bedside barcode administration. Uh, we've implemented an EMR. We've implemented FormFast. Uh, we've implemented various uh, cardiology, and uh, we have lab initiatives underway, perinatal, patient tracking, et cetera. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, why we're all moving towards automation. Um, I know a lot of people may be cynical, and rightly so, as far as, you know, it's not necessarily um, all um, there's definitely some challenges associated with it. I'm going to take a look uh, at what we've done here at Fremont Rideout Health System in California. Um, and initially I wrote, uh, you know, benefits versus pitfalls, and I decided to revamp that and show that it was benefits and pitfalls because uh, anybody who's been there and done that realizes that usually most implementations are a mixture of some success. But there's also some uh, failures, pitfalls, gaps, whatever you want to call them. I think today people use the term opportunity. Um, what's driving your automation? This is kind of a chaotic-looking slide. Um, I did that for a reason because usually you have a lot of different uh, dogs pulling the leash in various ways, kind of like those dog walkers. Uh, if that sounds familiar to you, uh, you're not alone. Um, some things that for us at Fremont Rock, that drove us towards automation was our desire to implement an EMR. Various reasons for that, and we'll get into that. Uh, and simultaneous track access is very much related to the EMR implementation. Um, we, we had just a general um, idea from various stakeholders throughout the organization that they wanted to upgrade to electronic systems for reporting, structured data, things of that nature. But not only that, for the actual patient safety, the clinical checking, um, and sharing information. Uh, in more than one space-time continuum. If I have a medical record chart and I'm a physician, I have it, you don't, um, if it's in paper form. 
but once you add it into the EMR, obviously, then we can access uh, a chart um, simultaneously or semi-simultaneously. Uh, like anybody else, we're positioning our organization for meaningful use. Um, we have realized vast savings with regards to paper storage, version control, um, no required forms uh, that may not scan very well. All that has been changed, and we'll get into that in a little while. Um, so moving on to the next slide here. What do you want to automate? Um, usually, the low-hanging fruit are discrete processes. Um, those are the easiest to tackle up front. I'm saying they're the only ones, but if you have something that's very procedure-based uh, and discrete, like a lab order, a lab result, um, even a physician, or something that's tangible, whether it's electronic data um, transaction or if it's a business workflow process, those are the ones you want to take a look at. Uh, for a hospital, obviously, you have patients who come in the door, uh, they're treated, they go out the door, and bill is dropped, and hopefully someone's overlooking the whole thing, monitoring and controlling the process. Let's look at registration. Um, we have uh, ADT systems. That's admission, discharge, transfer, for, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, so why are we putting ADT systems? Okay, sound obvious, but uh, we put in our ADT, our ADT system was 23 years ago, I believe. We just replaced it last summer. Um, it took months to extract millions of patient visits. Um, it was a, a big deal for this organization. Um, and why did we decide to, to go through the pain of this massive, uh, massive uh, replacement? Well, basically what you want to do when you put any system is you're going to gain um, the data capture in a consistent manner. Uh, so all registrars, instead of capturing patient information on paper, which they at one time did for most of us, uh, now they're all running through the same screens or running through the same script, capturing your patient data in a consistent manner. Um, and what else is obviously happening? Well, if they're capturing all this demographic data and assigning the medical record number or unit number, some people call it, and then the account visit or encounter number, um, all the data will flow through your electronic transaction management system into other clinical systems throughout your organization. And what this does is reduce the amount for every department to have to re-enter the same data. Um, uh, you're going to get rid of this completely, but um, they, uh, you don't want to have to maintain multiple databases. So interfacing uh, and having a single source of truth is, is a strong driver for the registration piece of it. In clinical areas, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the clinical systems and the barcodes. We put codes uh, on everything these days, it seems like. And um, I remember, you know, when I was a kid and, and you go to the tree store, you'd have people sitting there punching in individual prices, uh, probably keying in mistakes. Um, and the whole transaction for, for leaving the grocery store. Um, was a lot longer than it is today. Today, whether it's a grocery store, a Target, a Walmart, um, they guide the stuff across the barcodes. It automatically and accurately uh, registers the transactions, the tallying. So it increases your throughput. It increases your accuracy. Um, but the reason I bring this up, and you can see the red font, uh, where workflow might speed up and it might slow down. Um, so for a grocery store, or Walmart or a Target, I think you see the benefit in speed and throughput as well as accuracy. However, if you're going to implement barcodes on medications and wristbands and badges uh, and forms, um, there may be some slowdown in certain areas, and that's okay. Um, the slowdown uh, uh, be an artifact of an increase in patient safety. So, for example, with uh, bedside barcode medication administration, and tying all these uh, barcodes uh, on various items and having a nurse uh, scan the wristband of the patient, their own ID badge, uh, uh, and the patients is something that slows down their workflow. I think there's really uh, a challenge for them to, to, to meet the bar that it was before or even exceed it. However, if a nurse or a patient I really would want to have that layer of safety and accuracy uh, uh, tied 
that business process. So, so that's an example where barcodes may actually slow down a workflow process and we actually had some challenges with respect to the project stakeholder buy-in from that perspective. But once we explained how this protected their patient as well as themselves and the organization, uh, the buy-in was there. Uh, the billing aspect um, is, is pretty obvious. Uh, once you get electronic transactions, uh, associated with uh, charges, um, then we're automating your charge capture. And for for organization here, um, I was for my time, but I was told that when we moved away from a manual paper charge capture process in our lab, where we captured our charges with lab slips, when we put in our um, West system we with automated charge capture, we realized massive savings uh, within the first year to the tune of seven figures. Um, no more paper slips, charge slips in lab coats or stuck in a drawer or falling down between a crack, uh, between a desk and a wall or what have you. So that's another um, large and strong driver for formation is this charge capture. And uh, again, over all of this, you're going to have the monitor and control process. Hopefully, someone in administration, business development, what have you, is taking all structured data, they're running reports, they're building some analysis, and they're forecasting to increase the agility of the organization to respond to the external stimuli. Um, so the artifacts we found and that I've observed is that the maintenance aspects, um, and this may sound obvious, but, but it, you know, is um, is moving away from those large, ungainly manual paper maintenance processes with tractor feed printers and multiple TEs shuffling paper. You, you're not rid of the maintenance, but by moving it into an electronic format, um, then letting the computers crunch on numbers uh, overnight. The maintenance, it's important to understand that the maintenance does not go away. Uh, the maintenance has to be there. Um, it just takes a different form, and it can be faster, but when it goes down, um, obviously you have to hustle and, and make sure the system goes back up. Um, here, what I did with this slide here was um, uh, just to regurgitate what I had before, that automation does not always mean an increase in speed. It can manifest itself as an increase in quality. Um, if I'm a patient or a physician or a nurse, uh, I would certainly want a barcode um, protecting me. Fremont Rideout, to give you some perspective versus what I uh, came talking about with Howard University earlier, we're probably a little less than half her size, although I think our ER volume is actually higher. But we're basically a one-facility system. We have two hospital campuses. We have a cancer center. We've got an outpatient surgery center. We've got urgent care. We've got a foundation with the management services organization, which is uh, working towards an alignment. Uh, and we have some hospital-based clinics. Um, we're under 200 beds right now. Uh, we're building a new tower, so that may change a little bit, but I think we're still going to be uh, moving to private beds and not really an increase in number. Our IT department is um, two dozen FTEs, as you can see, um, and we have a PMO department with four project managers uh, driving the uh, some, but not all of the projects. Uh, I'd say most of the software implementations and some of the operational improvements are run through the PMO, but it's important to understand, and I get into this a little bit later, that um, every new system that goes in comes with the maintenance, and there's operational considerations that have to be um, put in the foreground. Uh, ops usually needs to be supported prior to projects. Um, our challenge at this organization, we were emerging from basically a zero spend philosophy. So when I came in in 2008 as a consultant, um, the aging infrastructure, there wasn't a, a huge amount of, of automation. And what was there was old. Um, our HIS system was 20 years old at the time. Um, there are certainly some suboptimal processes. This is no surprise. We all have, have them. Um, I was able to observe them firsthand during during a uh, six-week discovery process for the EMR, uh, during which I found out that uh, there were no barcodes on any patient forms at our organization here. So uh, enter FormFast. Um, we brought FormFast in and had the whole organization up and running on barcodes in six months.
Renaissance, and um, I'll get into that in the next couple of slides. Uh, we also uh, are trying to avoid some cookie cutter solutions, and um, by cookie cutter, I mean some vendors will just want to put in the minimal functionality so that it it uh, makes it easy for their maintenance and they, they can support it better. Um, at the same time, uh, you need to drive a little bit of customization to get a value add for your organization and push your vendors a little bit. And we're, we're moving towards that. And FormFast was very accommodating in that in that regard. Um, to take the extreme and, and go against vendor recommendations and over customization, you do run some risk when you do that. Some some organizations decide to do that, and that's okay. But the further away from a vendor supported solution you go, uh, the more at risk your organization becomes. Okay, well, I talked a little bit about discovery. Let's get into some of the details of that. That if you guys are moving towards forms, if you're moving towards barcoding, if you're moving towards an EMR, or indeed really any implementation, you need to perform a certain amount of discovery. That discovery is going to take place for this automation, either hopefully in the front end, that you can learn what the gaps are and address them and leverage time over the six or nine month implementation, whatever it is. If you do that, you will conduct the discovery, but you'll conduct it um, as an artifact of your implementation. And that means you're going to have to be extremely agile and hustle. And halfway into your implementation, you're going to have a lot less ability to affect change, and that change is going to cost a lot more money. So I strongly recommend that you do a one or two month full-blown discovery um, for an EMR. Talk to all your stakeholders on your clinical sides, your patient billing, your patient registration, your medical records. Find out what they do in their daily process and how that's going to be affected if you go with an electronic document imaging solution and if you go with barcoded patient forms. Take a look at the, um, the charts, uh, audit the charts, uh, and that will give you um, a indication of what type of paper is being utilized uh, in the organization. I conducted a audit of over 100 patient charts, cancer patients, ER patients, inpatients, outpatients, and you find things like inappropriate margins or documentation in the margins or blue forms that don't scan well, um, sticky notes with, with clinically relevant information on them. You need to look at all that and figure, well, how am I going to get this into my EMR? How is this going to be scanned? And then, uh, why are these people doing this? Why and and how can I stop it? Look at your form city, uh, your forms catalog if you have it, um, all those type of things. And we'll touch on that I think a little bit later. So for organization here, we, we conducted walkthroughs, the chart audits, the interviews, and we came up with about a hundred plus different workflow processes. And out of that, we we spun off about three hundred different charts or workflow uh, visio diagrams. That was that our patient registration system were doing their registration with the old 20-year-old system at the time, and they were making photo, they were getting up, making photocopies, they were storing the photocopies uh, in various areas. Um, we found that uh, uh, what was going on with our unit clerks and our nurses, uh, with respect to some of the issues I've already heard today, uh, different versions of forms, photocopies, fourth generation photocopies, different units using different versions of it, that was rampant. Uh, the costs for NCR forms were high, uh, maintaining and distributing the inventory in the PAR levels. Uh, quality of EMR forms were not up to what we anticipated for scanning. So all this stuff, uh, all spin off of the findings. Uh, and here's where I mentioned earlier our barcode duration for the project. We had the whole project implemented and executed initially in patient registration areas within four months, uh, including testing. And then we went live um, probably around our six month or so with our, uh, we tested one clinical unit, our step down unit, and uh, it worked pretty well there. We learned a few things. And at that point, we went big bang. Um, no sense in. Uh, drop the process, and, and it's mostly in time and dollars and everything. So we just went full bang on all the other clinical areas. So in a year, we had the old organization uh, enterprise-wide on barcodes for, for almost all patient forms. The benefits of automation. 
Um, that's the reason we're here today. And these are just some of them. Um, nurses can't find the address of gaff machine, or one nurse has it and the other nurse doesn't. That's gone. Everyone's just printing the forms out of the PCs. Uh, handwritten demographics, because the nurse can't find the address of the graph, that's gone, or should be all but gone. Uh, form version control issues, gone. Uh, the forms are much more consistent looking. They're scannable. Um, we're supply, uh, more uh, space. I know, uh, I think Kim mentioned the same thing with supply areas. Uh, every nursing unit had to uh, delegate a certain amount of, uh, or designate a certain amount of room for, for storing these forms. That's gone. Uh, and then uh, customization um, for on the navigation panel, for lack of a better word, uh, on your form imprint application, every nursing unit could arrange it according to their needs. And that was a good thing, although it did run, we were kind of victims of our own success, and I'll get into that in a sec. What were the pitfalls, or at least a couple of the pitfalls that we we had? Uh, well, some of them just came back and said, well, our NCR forms we can document clinically. And then I give the blue copy to pharmacy, and the green copy goes in the chart. Um, now we no longer have our NCR forms, so, so what do you do? Well, there's a couple ways you can approach this. You can change your workflow. You can print two copies out of form imprint, and the nurse push back on that is, well, now I can one area and not in the other. And I said, that's true, but that also existed during the NCR um, as workflow. You could document on the green copy and not on the blue. So um, that's really not um, uh, that's something that needs to be universally addressed. Um, and going up with electronic forms and systems would eventually obviate that. But that's something you definitely want to talk to stakeholders about, specifically nurses, respiratory therapists, about the NCR forms and what you think they can do they go uh, towards printing out of form and print. Uh, we actually, uh, the second bullet point here is we were a victim of our own su uh, success in a way because we have nurses floating between units and if each unit is organizing their form and print folder and forms a different way, then they need to just figure out um, you know, the same form might be in that unit. It wasn't a huge deal, but it was something we had to deal with. Any automation you, you have the process, and then you've got the, the systems. And of course, for, for those of us who have come through it, we realize there's the people, and some of those uh, resources are great, and other ones are kind of tough to work with. You have a way to control all of this. Uh, how do you control that? Well, what we hear at our organization, we have a strong uh, PMO, and we tr drive these implementations through the PMO so that we have the same methodology. We have a lot of cross pollination going on, and um, we kind of understand by chilling it through the PMO um, that there's a lot of uh, shared knowledge that goes back and forth. And these some of our, this is just a timeline of some of the things we've been doing with the barcodes and the emergency room and OR and um, theology, et cetera. I don't need to get into that. Examples of how, how our PMO is helping to implement automation at the organization. We're running um, reports uh, on a weekly basis for project tasks, and we are communicating with uh, IT and with engineering to make sure that a lot of these projects that require hardware and software, um, that, that all the people are uh, talking the same uh, language. Example where you're looking at uh, tracking project issues. An example of just a number of projects uh, that we put in here, um, our organization, and we're tracking reports on what we've completed, what's been put on hold, and why, things of nature. This is an example of looking at your resource conflicts. When you put in automation, you can gain a lot of um, benefits from um, from uh, a disciplinary approach, um, but at the same time, you need to understand what the operational constraints are when you uh, get into these resources from these other departments. You need to accurately put in how many FTEs it takes for this automation project. Are they going to be able to fulfill that need and get your project charters lined up and things like that? Um, so a little about the roadmap here and, and, and what we're doing with respect to. Uh, future uh, automation. Um, we're hoping to move forward with a, a 
culture change at the organization. We are doing culture change now. We're just not doing it like in a official or formal Lean Six Sigma type of process, but we are hoping to move down that road in the future. Uh, the organization is receptive to change, and a lot of stakeholders are doing phenomenal work. So, um, so we've really uh, realized some some gains there, but it's come at a cost. Um, sometimes it can be um, take a lot of uh, coordination to make the simplest thing happen. We can offer fast flow implementation at the organization here. And here I see a huge opportunity to automate some of our foundational business practices. Um, obviously, you want to take a look at those business processes and practices and make sure that they're optimal prior to automating them. Um, if you um, automate a bad process, you're just going to make a lot of mess. <laughs> so um, um, what we're going to do is take a look at uh, what we fix episodically versus what we can fix thematically. Um, we take a look at uh, stakeholder noise. We use that um, as a metric for measuring success. It's just one. It's not all dollars and cents. Sometimes I like to see the quality of the projects, and we're beginning to make moves into looking at quality as far as how our projects are implemented. Um, the amount of stakeholder noise for um, for fast for form in print for barcoding our forms was probably among the least, if not the least, um, for any of our implementations. Um, with days of go live, it all was quiet and just moving forward. And to me, it's pretty unprecedented. Usually, you have people complaining for six months, and in fact, over the past month, we've had two vendors make return visits six months to a year after the implementations to do some nip and tuck optimization programs. We've never had that with form fast. It just works out of the gate. Um, speed and accuracy increase with patient forms. Um, the things um, that just just had a lot of buying for other projects we were trying to do. Um, automating clinical infrastructure and systems. Um, obviously, we're all doing this, and, and the the need for a very strong interface transaction management team is paramount, um, and the need for absolute rigor regarding change control is paramount. Now, the more and more automation we put in and the more that these things all talk to each other and they're all tied together, you can't make a decision in a vacuum and take a system offline or make a major change to a system without it going through change control. Um, this really separates the, the novice from, from the uh, veteran. Um, these systems are all integrated and they're and there are ways we know, and they're integrated in ways we may not know. Um, organizations sometimes have a problem with the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, and that's what change control helps to mitigate that risk. Operational support, I put that in red. Again, um, it, it's mandatory to understand that maintaining operational support amidst all these projects uh, is paramount. Um, we had our network intranet go out from under us this morning <laughs> in some respects, so I had a little concern about joining the webinar today. Um, so obviously, we had resources point directly to that uh, to get that back up and running. Uh, just to read some of the lessons learned, and I think, uh, I think I'm right on time here. Um, looking at the pitfalls, uh, going electronic, it's, it's just not enough. Uh, we're all driving towards automation, but we have to be careful about what we select. We have to be careful about um, how we do it. Um, we have to look at the foundational business processes prior to automating them. Take a look at it. Does it make sense? Now let's point fast flow at it. Now let's point uh, technology or some other software system at it. Um, another uh, lesson I'm learning here is sometimes our organization and your organization, um, the appetite might be too big for the stomach. You really need to, this gets back to that resource contention uh, grid I showed earlier, where I think I bring that up here. Um, you look, look at the number of hours slated for each um, project role um, and just say, well, gosh, it looks like uh, between these four projects, we are overtaking this uh, particular individual. Uh, if you're not doing that, then you know, failure to plan is planning to fail kind of thing. You really need to be careful about that. And then um, the last pitfall is that workflow can be severely impacted by auto automation. And I, by severe impact, I'm, I'm using it in the traditional NIV connotation. Um, it can actually be a positive impact. 
impact in a severe, you know, amplitude. But um, you have to be extremely careful in healthcare. Uh, your tower codes to patient medications, that's great. Um, you have to understand how it's going to impact the nurse's workflow, pr- probably a negative way, but you also to look at how it uh, in quality and safety in a very, very positive way. And that gets into these benefits, the quality, the safety, the throughput, the productivity. Uh, obviously, they're all great. Capturing lost charges, um, I believe we saved close to a million bucks on that in, in let alone. Um, I, um, I think we saved uh, significant dollars, half a million or more with respect to uh, forms uh, since we've gone live. Um, do send our forms, especially multi-page with multi-font uh, color, very expensive. Um, they're just simply, for the most part, um, most of them are gone. Audit and compliance comes uh, into the foreground when you have data in a structured format, uh, which then allows you to do reporting and drive forecasting and have a, a more agile strategy. So, you know, look carefully at, at the business process, applying automation to it, doing your nipping and tucking and your auto optimization program six months, 12 months down the road, staying on top of that, uh, doing service line agreements every year to make sure that uh, that everyone's doing what they should be doing and that the system's being supported appropriately. Um, doing the appropriate upgrades and maintaining the agility through the optimization. The automation is driving that type of reporting. So those are some of the benefits as well as qualifying it with some of the pitfalls uh, that I share with you guys today. That concludes the presentation. Hey, Tony. All great information there. Uh, we do have several questions that came in. Uh, Sean is going to ask the first one, I believe. Tony, great presentation. We have a question here from Chrissy, and uh, I'm going to just kind of surround this with a little more context. But what you're doing is really uh, about change management and a lot of um, organizational change and behavioral change that you have to manage. And so Chris is asking, how do you get the physicians to stop writing in the margins of the forms that would be cut off in the, in the scanning process? That's a great question. Uh, what we did in our form designer was actually put a border on the forms, and we used vertical text along the border that says, um, do not um, do write in the margins of this form. It will not be captured in the patient chart. We actually physically type that on every single form that gets generated out of form imprint. You know, obviously, that doesn't necessarily preclude the fact that someone could do it, um, but um, but that's how we approached it. Did any other behavioral change or organizational changes or, um, you know, different things that happened in your organization that were kind of quirky like that? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll think of more and more of them um, as it went on, but we had to address things like, um, I, I think that kind of touches on a question that um, that Kim had to field as well. Um, with, like, for example, when the patient chart comes down, um, I believe someone asked about governance and how do you govern this, and that's, that's what I'm thinking. I think actually medical records needs to take a strong role with respect to that because they're the ones who get the patient charts as well as the loose material that may come down as a month later after the patient discharge uh, and needs to be matched to the chart. So it's medical records or health information management that actually uh, is getting this information. So they're seeing kind of on the back and what's happening as far as the behavior of the clinicians, the ward clerks, the nurses, um, they have that information. So they either need to have a positive feedback loop to the to the department and just march someone back up there um, and say, hey, don't do this anymore. In fact, they do march up there to gather the charts usually, so it could be something as simple as telling the chart uh, person when you get the charts from, from through to make sure to tell them that um, not to do anymore more not to do that. Um, in absence that, you could drive it through administration and just report on the behavioral issues that, hey, they're writing in the margins. Um, we need to come down on them through administration. You could do it that way as well. Great. Uh, we've got a question about, um, in reference to what, what you mentioned about the discovery and the importance 
importance of discovery. Uh, who in your hospital is responsible for analyzing the processes before you automate them? Do you have a committee that does that? We don't have a committee that does that. Um, we drive that through the project management office, so all of my PMs are tasked with going there, sitting with the department head, as well as other uh, project stakeholders, looking at the process, mapping out a Visio flow chart, looking at how the automation is going to impact it, and working with the vendor as well. Uh, one thing we don't have here, or but I think we need, and I think everyone needs, um, we have it in some respects, but not all respects, is a multidisciplinary approach um, for projects uh, on a formal setting. Um, right now, it's all being uh, burdened on the PMO, um, and it's working, but what I'd like to see ultimately is to have a, a committee that involves the the um, a more formatting, not just the project manager sitting with the department head and a few other folks, but rather a multidisciplinary approach, which really enhances the communication because, like I said earlier, the left hand might not know what the right hand's doing with all these systems now being integrated through, you know, E8 or Hummingbird or whatever your electronic transaction manager is. Um, you, you really need to have a team approach, a multidisciplinary team approach. And for a project that might be respiratory therapy with pharmacy, with nursing, with the medical staff, uh, we did have a physician champion um, to help us with uh, the barcode solution as well as our EMR, and we're taking that approach with physician order sets this year and CPOE. And how that came in. Uh, how do you pick the first process to automate with fast flow? What was the driver? Um, was the driver compliance or to speed up a process? Uh, could, could you have a question? Sure. What was what was the process to pick the first? Uh, pro, um, how did you pick the first process to automate for for fast flow? Um, the First, for process to automate for fast flow. Oh, okay. Um, so for fast flow, let me pull up my notes here. Um, we actually kind of reached out. Um, we didn't do any organization-wide thing. We basically had an internal process. We discussed it amongst ourselves. Um, usually discourage that kind of thing, but um, we need to be agile and not open it, you know, open it up to uh, a large bureaucratic process. Um, so we looked at several areas uh, based on the experience of what, and, and this is where we can leverage the experience of a PMO. But experience project management office will be able to uh, just meet, sit down with the, during a staff meeting. You can have the four project managers who've all implemented projects across various departments in the hospital. They know who the go-to people are. They know where the risks are, where you're likely to succeed, et cetera. So having that type of small, agile group uh, with that large domain knowledge allowed us to to come to a quick decision there. We reached out to medical records. We reached out to the compliance areas for physician peer review. We considered network access forms and onboarding with HR. We considered um, personal forms uh, changes, like when a person moves from one position to another, automating that. Um, description master maintenance communication, coding, physician coding queries, um, all these things were considered uh, by the group, and we came up with um, a list. Then we put the burden on the departments to say, work with us, and, 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 and we'll, we'll workflow with you, but we need to know what you're looking for out of this. And some departments were able to service that request quicker than others, and those are the departments that are going to uh, sign a project charter, uh, commit some resources to it, and then we're really excited about you know, implementing FAST. I believe once we get the first two or three uh, automation processes up down, then we're going to be having people lining up to do rack audit and all sorts of processes across the whole continuum. Perfect. Great response. That concludes our questions uh, for, for your portion. Thanks again Mike, for taking the time to, to be with us today. Um, great presentation. Great presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Next, our attention to ways we can connect with FormFast. Our Director of Product Management, Sean Curtis, will give a brief overview of our FormFast user group forum website, our core website, and the social media outlets we participate in. Sean? Thanks, Aaron. I'm just getting set up with the slides here. While those are transitioning over, I'm uh, monitoring the question and answer and the chat session, and I've got a couple questions.
questions. Uh, so what we're doing is so that we can keep track of what we've answered and what we haven't answered. We're marking those answered verbally. So if you came late and you missed one of those, feel free to just copy that and paste it back into the chat or question and answer window, and we'll just type in the answer to you um, to you there. All right. Uh, so what I'm here to talk about this afternoon is our social media. Social media the uh, sorry some back there social media being things like Twitter uh, Facebook sorry we're, we're having a slide issue here I have a slide floating So, um, in absence of slides, I'm going to be trying to uh, pull up some slides here real quick. I'll talk without the slides then for a little bit here. Uh, we are all active on on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube, and so we can allow you to to follow us or like us or friend us um, and follow our tweets and things on that. If you're not familiar with that, that's just social networking to where you can choose to to friend um, an organization, and what that does is it gives you updates and notices. Uh, say, for example, if we post a notice that we are uh, hosting a webinar or that we'll be at a certain booth at a certain uh, trade show, that will give you the information as to where you can go to, to see us and connect with us there. And uh, so, to the guys in the field, we really like it when we have customers come over to our booth, talk to us at the trade shows. It's, uh, it's good feedback for us, and it's something we really want to stimulate here. That's the reason behind the social networking. And it's also the reason behind um, FormFastUsers.com website, which I want to make sure that all of you are aware of, and that's something that we're building out and really giving you control of. So the place where uh, we've already seeded it with some discussion, we've seeded it with some uh, training videos and things like that. We're going to keep that going as far as adding more videos and adding more things. But really, what we want to know is if you comment on those videos that we put out there, so that we know what you like what you want more of, and how we can help you. That's really what we want. So that's at formfastusers.com. And it is one thing you do have to register for, and it is for customers only. Once you've registered and logged in, there is a little button on the side that says, uh, remember me forever. So you don't have to log in again and again. It's a really nice feature on the site. Also, inside of that site, we have it broken down into different uh, product areas. We have a a section that is uh, dedicated to our Meditech users, sections dedicated to our uh, e-signature areas and things like that, so you can get, find specific decisions around what you want to talk about or, or answer on and, and look at that for uh, you know, getting the help that you want. So now we've got some slides to work on here. The other thing that I want to talk about is at uh, formfast.com, we've released uh, what we call the video gallery. This video gallery can be found by right here, in the top right corner, if you can see my screen. Uh, you on that button, that takes you to our video gallery. And the gallery is a listing of um, a number of videos, maybe about 40 videos there, that you can click on those videos, and they're really quick, uh, two-minute videos, and there's a, a couple that are a little bit longer, more in-depth. But it really over what the value proposition and the messaging behind what these 
applications are that we're producing. So there's a whole uh, plethora of applications there that we've identified by talking to our customers and working with uh, our end users to define what it is that people are using our software for. And I'll give you a quick overview of how that can be used and how it is used um, at different organizations. So again, uh, we invite you to go into there, take a look at that. That's probably really relevant to the people who already know our software a little bit, which is um, all on the phone. So take a look at all those and, and uh, give us some back on that. This is a shot of the Form Fast Users Group, the formfastusers.com. So you can see what that looks like. And inside there, you can see we've got a lot of things going on. Uh, this is a forum, so we have people like yourselves and, and people that are in our audience now that post questions and uh, just communicate with one another. So that's the forum. We've had a lot of requests for a forum that people can communicate with one another. And that's part of what we're doing this afternoon, too, after this. Is we'll be doing to these. Uh, we're going to break out into these breakout sessions. Uh, we have smaller groups and, and be able to open phone lines and uh, and communicate with one another in a smaller group setting rather than this this large group that we have together to get together right now. Uh, within this view, you can see that we have uh, you know a few different things. Um, we have other posts and we have questions and we have videos that so there. Are different icons associated with each of those. So you can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash user slash form. We have some videos um, associated with that account, uh, some, some rough videos that show you where we're going, what our direction is, and the reason we're putting all this out, out there is really so that our users, our customers, and the people that are uh, in the market that we're serving are able to do what we have to say and then, then give us feedback because the nature of social media is different than anything we've ever seen before. It's not really push media like advertising and, and things of the past. This is a really collaborative type media, so this is a way for us to get feedback from you. Uh, Facebook, go ahead and uh, like us, friend us, and find us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash formfast. Uh, again, we, uh, we publish things that are going on, uh, things that you wouldn't see anywhere else. We don't do uh, everything through email. A, a lot of you are, are used to receiving an email from uh, the marketing group here or from the product management group here or the support group here. Um, some things just on uh, Facebook. So some of the things are there's an active community that, that listens to, to things we're doing on Facebook. Uh, so some of the, the things go out on that, and uh, you might hear about it in other ways. So we want you to uh, be able to get involved if you are uh, involved in Facebook. The same goes for Twitter. We'll, we'll tweet out things like uh, where we are at a certain event or, uh, you know, special offers that we have at a, at a booth that we might be at or, uh, you know, upcoming events that, that are uh, coming up. Um, and then at twitter.com slash formfast. Again, LinkedIn is more of a business forum. And this is where we uh, we work with groups on, on LinkedIn that are uh, involved in a high-performance hospital and involved in different uh, different areas of healthcare uh, and different areas of the whole market that we serve so that we can kind of stay abreast of the changes and the things happening there. And again, um, you know, if you follow us, if you join us in those groups, um, we can all kind of kind of work together, collaborate to make better solutions for for everyone. So this is the the quick over on uh, what social media is and what we're hoping to achieve by, by that. And again, it's, it's uh, the big thing is it's not a push marketing event. It's more of a collaboration. We really want to get in touch with you, our users, and, uh, and and from you. We've heard from you. Uh, through the question and answers today, we've gotten some good feedback and even uh, some good product suggestions. Um, we like that. We want everybody as active as we can as far as uh, going to the, the user group forum and, uh, and stimulating conversations there. Again, thank you for all the conversation and, and everything that you've done so far on formfastuse.com and, and um, these uh, social media sites. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. John indicated there are multiple ways for you to get better connected with FormFest. 
we value your thoughts and opinions, and and we rely on them to help us steer the direction of the of the company. So we're developing even ways to collect your thoughts. We better serve you and produce solutions that address your most critical needs. So that's why we're pleased to announce the launch of the FormFast Advisory Board. Our advisory board is designed to be a group of industry leaders that we can trust to give us their honest feedback about our products, how we're perceived in the marketplace, and their thoughts on trends in healthcare in general. To become a FormFast advisor, go to formfast.com slash advisory dash board. Once again, that's formfast.com slash advisory board. I'm going to put that in the chat section of the interface, so you can go to that link. Fill out the form, and you'll be notified when you're accepted as a FormFast advisor. By joining our uh, advisory board, invited to participate in survey, surveys, one phone conversations with a member of the FormFast staff, as well as occasional trips to meet with other FormFast advisors in person. Now we encourage you to participate in all advisory board activities. The extent of your involvement in the group is completely up to you. I thank you for taking the time to engage with us. Perks of being a FormFast advisor include eligibility for exclusive prizes, giveaways, and other benefits. Sign up today and help us to, to improve the business of healthcare. The address, once again, is www.formfast.com slash advisory dash board. If you don't choose, if you choose not to sign up, we still love to hear from you. Feel free to share your praise as well as your critique of our company by calling me directly at 314-677-3746. Once again, that's 314-677-3746. And my name, once again, is Aaron Vaughn. Looking forward to hearing from you. And then we'll be breaking the audience into three regional groups. We wanted to use this event as an opportunity for you to interact with other FormFast users. So we'll open up the phone lines and allow you to share your successes and insights with each other. First, a couple of quick instructions. When the session ends, you'll be presented with a map representing the three different breakout sessions. Click here to join the session. I know we're by a number of attendees from countries outside of the map graphic. Those attendees can choose any of the three sessions to attend. If you get disconnected in the process, you can get to the session selection page by going to formfast.com slash map. Once again, formfast.com slash map. When joining, you will have the ability to join the teleconference by following the instructions in the dialogue that appears. Once connected, you will be muted by the host. You can mute and unmute your telephone connection by clicking on the button to the right of your name. Please make sure that you are muted until you would like to contribute to the conversation. If you do have something to say, unmute the connection to add a comment or to ask a question. And make sure to mute the line when you're done, and this will prevent the occurrence of distracting background noise for the rest of the attendees. Thanks for the time to join us for day one of our visionary showcase and user group meeting. Please, please join us again at 10 Central Time to learn about new products, particularly FastFlow and a few other FastFlow applications, not to mention to getting a chance to win another Apple iPad 2. If you have a for day two, you can do so at www.formfast.com slash webinars. Enjoy breakout sessions, and we'll see you tomorrow.